Okay, friends, welcome to the session on logistics management. As I explained, logistics is all about movements. Movement of goods. And goods means moving from this point of from where it is made to the point of consumption. But you can see from consigner to consignee. So when there's a movement, there's a storage also in the So in summarized version, I would say logistics is all about movement and storage of the goods from the one end to another. Our interest when we talk of word management, we want it to be cost effective. We want it to be efficient. We also want to be sure that this adds value. To us. So with this background, let me start now what I plan to cover up. The learning objective, what I've kept for today's session, for one hour session is understanding the concept of logistics. What exactly is logistics? Logistic chain. So the logistic chain also has to be you can do that around. Selecting the mode of transportation. Now, then we'll talk about in quote terms 2010, 3PL versus 4PL, insurance, shipping documents, receipt of goods. They are all accompanies with the movement of the goods. When the goods are moving, these are all required around. Then the storage company, the warehouse management and activities. Warehouse designs, I'll try to touch a little bit. How do we locate the stocks around? Cross docking, bulk break around, those concepts we like to make it very clear. Then once you have the warehousing, obviously you have the inventories. The inventory has to be managed. And when we are placing an order, then economic order quantity has to be understood. Inventory cycle is there, classification is there. And above all, in today's world, we need to understand the technology and tools, plus the KPIs which are required in logistics. To summarize, I would say the objective is to move the goods in a supply chain effectively and efficiently to extend the desired level of customer service at the least cost. Plus, I would say you should add value to this. That's the way we look at it. Now, coming back to the understanding of logistics around. Logistics address the essential transport link between consigner and consignee with the aim of receiving the goods when and where they are needed. Now, this necessitates a close collaboration between the procurement, supplier, transporters, all other parties which are involved into this. So when we're doing all this, there may be risk involved around, but then we'll also talk about how do we can mitigate the risk as well. So the definition which comes, again, from ISM USA, it is basically the part of supply chain. Some people confuse logistics with supply chain. I remember a few of the workshops where I've been around. They say it's a supply chain workshop, but technically they talk of only logistics. To me, the supply chain is a much wider term. It covers much wider things. As you know, all of you, the score model starts from planning. Second is sourcing. Third is operation. And after operation is all the distribution part. And after distribution. So in short, logistic is part of it. Very important part of it, I would say. So I would say it's an important part of the supply chain. It plans, implements, and controls the efficient, effective flow and storage of the goods. That's what the warehousing comes into the picture. And related information. Keep this factor in mind. It is not the physical just flow. Information also is required around at what price, at what documentation, so everything is required around. The point of origins to the point of consumption is required. The objective of logistics, obviously we want the rapid response. We want minimum variance. If somebody is asked for 20 laptops around, it should reach 20 laptops. The days is fixed, the timing is fixed, it should reach at that time around. Quality part, there should be no damage on the way around. Transit damage, I'm talking around. The quality, what is made is made, but the whole logistics part has to ensure if it's a fragile item, it's not broken. It reaches in proper time. Logistics, bigger picture, if you look around, there are three components. The first component is the transportation part. Second is distribution. And third is import-export. 
So all these three parts are part of the logistics. Transportation is a major, major component. If I look from the costing angle, transportation alone costs around 56, 57% around. Distribution. That means the goods have reached the warehouse, finished warehouse, and now I'm trying to distribute it. The last is import export because today we live in the world of global, globalized world. So many things are being imported. And then we are also exporting worldwide. So that part also becomes part of the logistics as well. If you look at the chain, some of them may think it is more like a supply chain, yes, but it is covering the logistics part only. The logistics covering the raw material part goes to storage. From storage is going to production. From production, I make the finished thing, might be pipes or maybe sheets, goes to the warehouse, and from warehouse goes to market to the customer. So that's my logistic chain. So logistic chain has got two components. One is the physical supplier. That means supplying the goods till my factory product place. Because within the factory also, I'm having the work in progress. But then the, once the goods are ready, it gets into the physical distribution. Now the word management, as I said to you in the beginning, it is nothing but achieving the cost effective and efficient flow. So this is the key bottom line, I would say. Logistic is all about movements, but the moment I use the word management, that means I want this to be cost effective. I want it to be efficient. I also want this to add values to this. Logistic scenario, if you look of India as India and other neighboring countries around or some top countries, the parameters, if you look, the World Bank index, if you look on the logistic performance index, India still ranks 54th out of 160. US ranks 9th out of 160. China ranks 28th out of 160. It's based on performance parameters. The key performance I would say around is how much it costs us. Now looks at the GDP, if you look around of the logistics, it contributes 13%. US, it is 8.5%. China is 18%. Now, if this cost, if I look around in three parts, transportation, warehousing, and others. So the transport part, if in India you look around, is 63% of my cost is getting into transportation. And within transportation also, I would say, by road is one of the major ones. The type of industries, obviously pharma, auto components, the challenges which we have still, in spite of big growth on the infrastructure, road network, road network and loss during transportation. So those are the key things. Around. Now, when it comes to the logistics game, before we start, the very first step is planning. I think the planning is a key thing. Whether you're doing procurement, you plan. If you're designing a supply chain, you need to plan. So planning is very important around, as I summarize here in the last line, if you don't know where you're going, how can you expect to get there? So logistic, when I start planning around, okay, guys, my goods have to go to these, these places. These are my distributors. These are my customers. I'm going to have some transport companies around. Now, how they will go, which route they will follow. Will they go with the full truck load? Will they go with the least truck, less than truck load? All that planning has to do to make optimum use of resources. So basically, I need to plan based to get the optimum use of my resources around. Now, let's look at the requirements of the logistic when I'm trying to ship the goods. Basically, I will move the goods around. Whether you are in manufacturing industry, you need the goods. Whether you are in a service industry, you also need goods. Now, what we are looking around in this case, logistic requirement, the first thing is the mode of transportation. So when I'm planning it, I will see, guys, what type of mode of transportation? Should it go by air? Should it go by truck? Should it go by train? Should it go by sea? then who are the forwarding agents around? Do I really need the forwarding agents? Can I do it myself around? The next is the packing part. If packing is done well, I can save the space. What material I'm using for packing? That? So the packaging material which I'm using, is it recyclable? Is it environmental friendly? The next thing comes the containerization. I would say this is one of the big revolution to bring the containerization so I can put all my things into the container. So once I put it into the container, I don't have to do the packing so well. 
If items are outside the container, then certainly my cost of packaging goes up. Packing, shipping instructions, how do I give it? What type of shipping instruction I should do? Labeling part, what label should go? What information should go on the label? You know? Shipping marks, input terms, insurance during transportation. You're sending it, so possibly there are risks. The truck may get overturned, there may be theft, there may be losses. Somebody steals something on the way around. So how do I cover through insurance around? Shipping documents. So shipping document also, what type of ship documents I need around to get my custom clearance done, as well as if I want to export it, what type of shipping document. So shipping document were both for export and import. Receipt of consignments. Now I got the goods now. What do I do? Should I just say, okay, receive? Or what precaution I need to do it around? Next one is restriction also. If I'm involved in procurement, certainly I need to know what are the restrictions. If I'm importing something, I don't want to import something from X country. Then I find at the custom, they're not releasing it. Or if my country's company is involved in exporting, I should know whether we can do it, what documents are required around. So if you look at the modes of transportation, the one is a rail, one is a truck, one is air, one is a pipeline, one is a water. Each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. If I look from the cost angle, obviously the water part is the lowest cost, huge capacity. But the disadvantage is slower and limited routes, more weather sensitive around. Next one, if I look around economical part, I mean pipeline certain is a low cost, but the pipeline I will use only in the case of oil, crude oil is coming from one place to another place. It's much easier, very reliable. But the rail truck and air, air is the costiest one but it's very fast, less damage, less packaging cost. The disadvantage is the cost of my, by sending by air is very costly. Now between the rail and the truck, rail is the economical one. So for some items like bulk items, if I'm sending tons of steeds around from one city to another cities around at a remote place, I can use rail around with open and open on the top. So truck also there. So each one has own relative advantages and disadvantages. I think this gives you the really good ideas around the cost efficiency of different modes. If you look at the inland water, seaside, see if the one side we're given the cost efficiency in terms of tons per kilometers or per liter of fuel. So if we look at that way, that means basically the optimum use of fuel at the end of the day, that's the main cost. I can do 105 here, the rail it is 80, the road is 25. So that means I can use much more kilometers, ton kilometers with the same one liter of fuels. So that means this is the most optimum use of the fuel. Inland water, rail is the next one, road is the worst one I can call around. The road obviously creates pollution as well. Now the transport preferences when we talk around. So here I'll try to give you some practical tips what we can do. Cheapest means of transport that means delivery requirements. It has to match. If delivery requirement says it has to reach in seven days and you're trying to send by some mean which may take more time. So it has to meet with the delivery requirement. That sets the tone. Scheduling through the fewest number of transshipments. Uh, you, when you're trying to do the routing part from one place to another country, you have to try to see least number of transshipment. More the transshipment mean more chances of damage are there. So that planning should be done. Shipping wire preferred transshipment points in customs. Some customs are much preferred. I had the chance to work in many other places in Africa. I remember the goods. Sometimes there used to be disaster. We were sending to some port 
the port was so small, it will take ages to get it clearance. So you have to see what are the preferred places for customs around. Uses dedicated freight forwarders wherever possible. I think the freight forwarders are useful from that angle around wherever you're sending the goods to X country or Y country, they know how to get it clear very faster. Now, the one rule is that applying one to four ratio rule for air shipment, ship by air if less than 25% of the cost of the goods. If the cost of the good is costing you $1,000 and the shipment cost is $250 is fine. But if it is more than that, then by air I will avoid it if I can. So one to, one to four rule, this is what practical tip I'm just sharing with you. We used to do now. Shipping by air, if the weight is less than 200 kgs, we may go for it. Shipping by air when a cold chain is required, particularly the farm items. If we want to send them goods, we have to send by this. Shipping by land or sea, if dangerous goods are involved around. If you feel there are dangerous items which can explode around, certainly then you have to go by land and sea. Otherwise, no. Selection of the methods of dispatch, again, the rule of thumb I want to talk about here is relatively high values, ratio wise, volume wise, they use air freight. Less volume, but the value is much bigger. But if the volume is bigger, then I would say, guys, I'm sending cotton or something, then I'll use sea freight. Around. So try to be very careful where to use air freight, where to use sea freight, to a lot extent, the rule of thumb is which items are very voluminous, item price is very low, but they're very voluminous. I'll go with C, truck, whatever is the train. But if it is less voluminous, cost is very high, look at gold. If you want to send gold, high value. Volume is very less. You do by your train. Packing part. I think this is also very important around, but packing to a lot extent, is driven by the mode of transportation. If I'm doing by air, my packing could be simple. And then also if I'm sending by container, my packing could be easier. So that factor will count a lot, the durability part, the size, the weight of the package around. So these factors become important to us. So when to use 20 feet container, when to use 40 feet containers, you have to see the port facility. You might be trying to save the money by using a 40 feet container, but in that port, it may not be practical. So one has to look into this factor as well. The labeling and the shipping marks. So when you are trying to send the goods, you must mention who is the consignee, what is the destination, port of unloading, project identifications, order number, case number. So these information must be there. Now, one should be very careful not to write the contents of the package. If I say I'm sending electronic goods inside, there's a possibility that somebody could steal it. So if you want to discourage the theft and pilferage, never write the content of the package. So outside, you're basically saying consignee, the destination, port of unloading, where it is going, or project identification, if you're going to say which project, order number, case number. If there are five cases, I'll say one of five, two of five, three of five, four of five, five of five. So the guy who receives it can tell me, Krishan, we have received one of five, but two of five is missing. So that way it's easier to communicate around, makes the communication easier. Coming back to the next subject on input terms, very important around developed by international chambers of commerce. The key purpose is to avoid conflicts and difficulties. If suppose tomorrow we have, I'm sending the goods to somewhere, the ship is over sun, a truck has met with an accident. Now who is accountable? Who's going to bear the losses around? The truck has come to my place and my warehouse. Who's going to unload it? Who's going to pay for it? or I'm loading something into the sea, let's say into the ship, the crane is broken, it falls into the sea. 
who is accountable. So basically, we try to define the roles of the buyer and the role of the supplier. So in this case, since the shipment is involved, input terms, I think knowledge is very important around. So these are standard terms. Now they come under the four categories, on E, F, and C, and D. Either they start with E. Under the E term, there's only one X works. Then we have F, FCA, FOB, C is there, CIF, CIP, and all those things around. D terms, DAP, DAT, and DDO. So these are the terms around which we use, reflecting the business to business practices around. Now in the past, input terms was, as the name indicate, IN is international commerce terms. But these terms, input terms to 2010 can be used for both international and domestic shipment. So it is applicable to both. Please look back, I think wherever companies I have visited around and worked as a consultant, I do ask them, your truck is moving, your shipment is moving, Let's say from Calcutta to Delhi, what income terms are using around? Who's going to bear the losses around? Who is accountable? The roles and the responsibility, how are you defining it? Are you going to write a big paragraph? Or you want to go with the international terms? So this is where I want this income terms plays a key role, both for domestic and international. Look at this chain. So if you start from the one end seller, Obviously, somebody has to make the export documents. Now, question come, who makes the export documents? Delivered at the point, at the name place, terminal point. Now, somebody has to load it. It goes on the ship's rail is there, on board. Then again, it leaves the board. And then the port of arrival is there. At the port of arrival, again, the crane has to get the container out. Delivery at the name port of destinations, custom clearance and then it has to go to the buyer's place. So in this whole chain of activities around, there are risks and there are costs. Who bears a cost around? Up to what level? And that depends on the type of input terms. Buyers takes risk at what point to what point? Seller takes the risk from what point to what point? And this is where most of the D terms you'll find, the seller takes a risk up to the port or even up to the, depending on the type of D which you're using it. So the whole risk goes up to the other end. While if I'm going with the X works, the buyer takes the risk from beginning to end. So when seller takes the risk, costs are also there around, obviously the, then seller takes the risk around, the buyer has to pay the cost for the whole. Now, as per Inco terms 2010, there are 11 Inco terms. Now you will find seven of them can be used for any mode of transportation. You might be sending the good by sea, water, air, whatever you may call. You can use any of these seven. But then these four are relevant purely, purely for sea, inland waterways, transport only. So if you're doing inland waterways, it's not necessarily sea. So even within the country, if you want to move on the inland waterway, so we can use any of these four around. Any mode of transportation, so you have X-Works, FCA, CIP, CPT. You can use CIP in place of CIF, but not the other way around. If I'm sending the goods by air, I can't use CIF. Now the commonly used in code terms are FOB, I think most of us, particularly those companies, big companies, who have got their own shipping agents around, who have got their own insurance, they use free on board, or free carrier. Then there's a next group which does CPT, CFR guys, because they don't have middle, middle level companies around who don't have big facilities around. They say, guys, you take care of delivering us. And we will take care of paying you the shipping charges around. But insurance part, we take care. So that use CPT, CFR. But if you say, guys, I don't have insurance facilities around, let this guy take care of it, then CIP, CIF. The last, which are very popular one, is the DAT and DAP. So DAT is the one delivered at terminal. So the goods can go up to terminal. Then you have to get it unloaded, get the custom clearance, and take to your point. While in the case of delivered at place, 
it goes up to the place after custom clearance, load it into the truck or train, goes up to your place, wherever the warehouse is there, then you get unloaded and take care of it. So depending on the role, the risk, and the responsibility and the cost changes around. Now, next thing come is insurance during transportation. This question I do ask every time whenever I ask sometimes companies, what type of insurance coverage you have? Insurance is required, we all agree. We're doing transportations. It's all vulnerable to risk. It could have damage, it could have pilferage, it could have theft, it could have breakage, it could have non-receipt at all. So the cargo insurance is very, very important around. I think we all people, whether in the logistic business or procurement business, should understand what is the coverage there. So here I would like to show around is there are three types, cargo clauses. It's called A, B, C. You may say A is all risk per se, C is the least coverage around. So institute cargo clauses, A is considered the widest insurance coverage, but does not mean all risk. I know sometimes we use the word all risk, technically it does not cover all risk, but covers widest, I would say. Around. B covers restrictive coverage. C covers the most restrictive part. Now, some might be covering, if on the way sea water goes into my container, goods get damaged, is it covered or not? Or is a big rain going on on the way, ship is crossing through a place where there are a lot of rains around, and container is not so good, is it covered or not? Are the goods have reached the warehouse on the weekend, but I have not entered into this, and from there it is stolen. Is it covered into the insurance or not? Are my goods are coming via route, which has a war? So in the war zone, it is coming around. So in the bombing, it may get destroyed. Is it covered or not? So those part, I think you have to look into it, what is covered, what is not covered. But certainly I can say that way, the war risk is not covered. You have to pay extra for it if you want this to be covered for the war risk. The next thing which is very critical is the shipping document. So shipping document, particularly when you're doing import and export, each one of you should know what is the bill of lading for C shipments. If you're not doing by C, then it's a way bill around. Commercial invoices are very, very important around. Packing list, certificate of origins, gift certificate. If somebody is giving a gift to you that the value is zero, custom is not going to accept the zero value alone. You need to provide all this documentation. If it is coming as a sample piece to you, you might be showing as a gift or you might be showing as a zero value, but custom will say, no, this come under the inch. I mean, custom duties. So you need to have all those documentation as well. So you need to have a gift certificate which proves the value of the goods also. Additional documents, forward a certificate of receipts, freight invoice, and additional documents which has to certify the qualities if you want to have the quality is good. If it has been done pre-shipment inspection, then certainly you need. Now the shipment has come, the consignment is there with you. Consignment should perform cursory inspection of the package. This practical tips, I wrote one shipping guide when I used to be the UN. I think this is very, very important. Some is very common that we receive the good we say receive. What does it mean receive? Nothing. You have to say very clear words around received in good external condition, contents unchecked. If I just say receive, and tomorrow we find is a broken inside. So it basically, I think, deflates the purpose around. So my request to you will be, because since you don't have a time to open up and check everything, it's like I received in good con external, good external conditions, content check. But if you find there is something visible mark, there's a tampering, edge is broken. You can say case is broken. You're not saying inside is broken, you're saying case is broken. Content is lacking, cartons open with sign of pilferage, blah, blah, blah. So you have to be very careful about it. I would say one step more even, whenever you get something costly stuff, get the, get the weight of it. You know the bill of lading, the weight is given there. 
check the weight what is declared and the weight what you have got around. Compare the two. If you find there's a discrepancy big way, that means some item have been taken out. The box may look beautiful, everything may look good. So please check that also. Now insurance normally extends, I would say, if you're having your own insurance, it's coverage from 30 to 60 days in storage destination. So even the goods have reached to your warehouse. So those you may be later on, I know covering your warehouses, but still most of the insurance covers even 30 to 60 days. I am aware of my, the global insurance I had around. All our goods worldwide, wherever they go, whichever warehouse they go, we used to have 60 days coverage even after the seat in the warehouse. Suppose if anything damage happens around, damage happened to the warehouse, but the goods are lost, I can claim for that. And insurance cost is not very high. I'm talking of 2008, 9, 10, we used to pay one person for the global insurance. And coming under the A category. Now, as I said in the beginning, there are restrictions for export and import. So please do your homework in advance before getting tied up with other last minute problems around. Some countries, today they may not be having restrictions. Tomorrow's restriction comes up. The ban comes up. We all hear about in the oil industry. So we have to be very careful from where to import, what type of restrictions are there, all the things are there. If any approvals are required around, you need to get, particularly those in the pharma companies. If you're trying to import something for the pharma, you need clearances well in advance. Telecom equipment, the pharma equipment, they need some authorization very well in advance. So any one of you who deal with these two products, certainly I would say, check in advance. Forwarding agent, certainly we all of us use it when it comes to custom clearances. Forwarding agent, also we use it. I've got a small packet to be sent. I don't have a container load. I don't have a truck load. I give it to the freight forwarders. They combine together, they consolidate and try to get the best rate for me for ship. So forwarding agents plays a key role from that end. Even the shipment container has to be sent to other places. You can take the help of forwarding agents, take care of shipment, take care of insurance, whichever you want. Coming back to the types of logistics that I was saying in the beginning, there's an the inbound part. The goods are coming from supplier to your drums. So that logistic has transportation. So that transportations, again, is one component. Outbound logistic, again, there's a transportation. Third party logistics, fourth party logistics. If I have outsourced totally to third party, or I have taken fourth party, which is more like a consultant, reverse logistics. So they're all different type of logistics you could talk about. 3PL and 4PL. I know there's a 1PL, 2PL, 3PL, 4PL, 5PL. But let me touch the very basic. 1PL is very simple. I make something, I deliver at the shop around. It's a 1PL. 2PL, I've got my own transportation company, transport office around. 3PL means I'm, trans I'm outsourcing it. The word is third party. Third party means I'm giving a contract to someone. I'm outsourcing my logistic operation to a specialized company. So that company could take care of my transportation, could take care of warehousing, could take care of cross docking, could take care of inventory management, could take care of packing and freight forwarding as well. So I'm outsourcing that activities around, but question come in the 3PL, your supply chain is very big. Let's say if I'm taking my supply chain I'm getting the goods from X country. It comes to my premises. My premises, they make it, assemble it, find finished goods around. Now that part of the whole chain, I could give it to 3PL. Another component, my goods are ready. Now it has to go to the warehouse. Again, I can give it to 3PL. From finished goods, I have to send to someone else. So those supply chain has got different part, which I can give to various 3PL. So I'm not giving to the 3PL the complete supply chain. I'm giving one part of it. The part could be inbound logistics, could be outbound logistics. So those part, I'm giving it to 3PL. I'm outsourcing it technically. 
with all the related activities. But in the fourth PL, I go one step further. I think this gives a beautiful clarification around. TPL means oftentimes owns warehousing, transport, they have the assets. Focus on day-to-day -day operation. They could be taking care of one areas around. I'm dealing with X supplier, then they say, guys, okay, from this supplier, you're getting all your goods up to this place. I give it to 3PL. Now, in the case of 4PL, they are more like consultants. It's a logistic company. They may not have asset at all. So they look into optimizing it. They are basically the single point of contact for the whole chain. So if my supply chain, I'm getting the goods, let's say from China, some parts, some from others, then I'm exporting to three or four countries around. The complete supply chain, a particular product, I give it to one. Now that person basically further outsource to various 3PL. So 4PL takes care of. Now, this subject, when we talk about the share of 3PL, you look around Japan, 80% is done through 3PL. And the key question comes, is logistic my key business? I'm a pharma company. I'm a logist, I'm an I'm auto company. Is logistic my key things? My key thing is to make a good product. Logistic is not my cup of tea. So why should not I outsource to the experts for that? And it has been found through various surveys around when you outsource it, you around save around eight to nine percent. So that's a big saving. So in Japan, it is around 80 percent. US, you can see 57 percent. Europe is 40 percent. India is very less, nine percent. But I can see in the last one year, a lot of improvement has happened around. TPL, many companies are coming up. I think this is the direction. If I look as a trend, 3PL is becoming a very powerful thing around. The KPI is when I look of logistics only, from the basically of transportation side. Logistic cost as a percentage of sales, inventory terms around, total inventory days, source to delivery, warehouse cost as percentage of sales. I might be having a warehouse in a very costly place. My burden goes up my profit goes down. So I will like to have my warehouse in a place which is economical for me. Finished goods, inventory terms, raw material this. So this is where we look at it. Now coming back to the next storage part, as I said to you, logistic is combination, is a movement. And movement means there's a warehouse also going to be there. Storage is going to be there. Now the warehouse is an operation that stores, repackages, stages, sorts and centralized goods of material. So the function which are required around is it consolidates. So if you have seen the retail business around, trucks are coming from different places, but now the material has to go to another 20, 30 retailers. So they're basically doing the consolidation and then they're spreading it. Product mixing, docking, service, and protection against contagions. So some protection in case this happens. So that part also we have to worry around. The activities which are there in the warehouse, any warehouse, which we are all conversant, first thing is to receive. The goods are coming from supplier to the warehouse before it goes to the factory. You receive it. You identify the goods as the exact correct same specs. Then dispatch the goods to storage hold the goods for some time, pick the goods. Now the pick the goods mean that means if I'm trying to pick up the items around, then I marshal the shipments around. If 10 items have to go to one client, I collect the pick the goods around, okay, three computers, three this one, three computers, three tables. I pick them together and try to make one package. Dispatch the shipments, operate on information system, which is very critical. Record must be maintained for items. Everything which goes out has to be recorded. Back. A typical warehouse, if I look around space requirement wise, you have a receiving side, you have a shipping side, you have order picking, your order assembly, 
office storage miscellaneous so miscellaneous i could keep something item which are there to maintain this if i got a belt somewhere around or i have got something i need some spare parts to be kept around so storage are there with a different shelf receiving i'm getting and then some item will go inside to storage some could go straight to the again to the shipment part final space so without of without registering them state goes to the shipment there the next in the warehouse the stock locations to provide the required customer service to keep the track of where are the items are stored around so you have to take care of this and minimize the effort to receive put away and retrieve items that's the bottom line which we expect from any good stock location philosophy at all so keeping that in mind so we try to say the group functionality related items together item which are related together electronic item pharma item this item furniture items so again within furniture this relates to the living room this relates to the bedroom this relates to kitchens we try to go functionality wise group fast moving items together some items are very fast moving so we would like to put them on the front side some are slow moving maybe i'll keep them at the back end or even the higher height you know group physically similar items together so some items are physically same some are casting i'll keep them together some are machine component i'll keep them together some are brass i'll keep brass made item i'll keep them together some are plastics so, so you have to keep physically similar items together location wise you could have a fixed location put on each point ki this is meant for this this one is meant for this if i am an auto company air filters will be this seats will be here so the music system would be here so you have a fixed location second is a random location the fixed location means there's a wastage of space i my inventory might have gone down and still having a space for that so floating is wherever i get the space i try to use a maximum space of it so that's the way i would say the cubage use proper uses is there point of use storage around inventory store close to the where it is needed used in repetitive manufacturing git system so this one is used for git just in time is the one where we used to have minimum inventory sir i would say basically we expect supplier to keep their inventories i tell them ki guys my tomorrow's production is this material should reach me at this time 9 o'clock 10 o'clock depending on my schedule so we try to make it leaner and leaner so the way i have seen in toyota's plant when i visited them most of these suppliers are very in the same vicinity you know so they are able to git very well the concept of cross talking this word comes very often and sometimes even when we interview the people around it was started by walmart long back what is cross talking what is bulk break so these two term i want to clarify around now let's say my goods are coming from different places typically i'm talking of a retail business so one is giving me the computers one is giving the food items one is giving some other item furniture items now the warehouse is coming but all these are meant for someone at a small retailer place and the retailer has asked me to give me some food items some furniture items some this item i'll bundle them together and state this set without doing the registration so in short i basically large economical shipments i make it straight to one instead of sending one by one i know that this retailer wants 20 of this i got all of them i bundle them together and send them so this is the advantage of cross talking and this philosophy was developed you can say by walmart second is a break bulk now here i'm trying to do is like cross talking but usually refer to a single source there's only one source now i'm splitting that requirement whatever has come into different parts so from big warehouse i'm distributing is my distribution center from distribution center i'm sending it to various retailers various customers i spread this straight to them so i break the bulk the bulk has come from one supplier and i've broken it and it's going to the right place 
Now, next is the inventory part. So when we talk of inventory, it's nothing but stock, store. So inventory, we say at home also we keep inventory. Inventory is nothing but a stock. Now, this stock or store of goods around could be two types. One could be independent demand driven, second is demand dependent demand. Independent demands means basically that's what drives those of you who are conversant with bill of materials. If I'm talking of a bike, my independent demand is I need 20 bikes. But to make each bike, I need many components. So for one bike, I need two wheels. I need so many paddles, one, one frame for each one. So those become my dependent demand. So when I'm trying to make inventories to take care of my need and the customer need, I know I need independently so much, dependent so much to take care of my customer requirements. The types of inventories which we have, raw materials, very first, components you made, work in progress, I'm in the production shop, it is going on. The next is the finished goods, distribution inventory, and the last is MROI, always. So you have basically these six type of inventories in any organization. Now the function of inventory is to meet my anticipated demand. So why I'm keeping inventory like at home, my demand is so much, I shouldn't be running back to the shop for the last minute. I don't want a firefighting. So I should have sufficient material available to take care of my production. My production should not come to a halt. The next come to smooth production requirement to decouple the operations. Now operations side, I don't want my inventories linked with the operations. Around. Obviously it is required to cope up with the operation, but still I should be do independently what I should have it. If I feel my price is low and the price is going to go up, let me buy other way around to protect against stock outs. So the bottom line, I would say, of inventory is to protect against stockouts. Because the stockouts are there, you're going to lose customers, you're going to lose production. That's the losses are there. The key inventory terms, I would say, those of you who are studying the subjects, or those who are appearing for CPSM exams, try to know the term is lead time. When you place an order to the supplier, how much time it takes to deliver the goods to you. That's the lead time. Holding cost. So in inventory, when I'm keeping the items around, let's say for six months, one year, two years, there's a carrying cost. It's occupying a space. And you're paying the rent for that. You're paying electricity charges. You're paying air conditioning charges. So those holding costs has to be there. The next come the ordering cost. You place an order. So there's an ordering cost, whether I'm making order for 10 pieces or five pieces or 20 pieces, there's an ordering cost. So when I'm making the order for 20 pieces, my 20 piece order is the whole cost is spread over 20. But when I'm making 10, my whole cost is spread over 10. Then the shortage cost. Assuming that I'm trying to become very lean. Guys, okay, I don't want to keep inventory. Inventory is a waste of money. Yes, I want to become leaner, but then situation could happen. Some strike or something. Goods are not coming. So that means your plant comes to a halt. In that situation, you're going to lose something. You're going to lose customers. You're going to lose production. So when cost, when demand exceeds supply. So that's where we have to be very particular about shortage costs around. If there is demand has gone up and you're not planned for it. Now effective inventory management when we look around is a system to keep track of inventory. You have, when we talk of inventory management, you need to keep a track of it. The reliable forecast of demand also is required and knowledge of lead times. Every forecast, if I know very well, after 15 days, I need 1,000 pieces of this, then I have to check back, what is my lead time for that item? And then depending on the lead time, what should be my order size? 
reasonable estimates of holding cost. You should all know it. Ordering cost, shortage cost, and last but not the least is classification system. I'll be touching only one type of classification system, ABC. There are others, but the most popular is ABC still. Now the objective is we want to have inventory turnover to improve. So inventory turnover, when I say 12, that means I'm basically carrying inventory of one month. Let's say my turnover is 100 crores. And my average inventory is 10 crores. So 100 divided by 10, that means there's a turnover is only 10. That means it is covering 1.2 months inventory around. So in short, we want, when we talk about GIT is basically less and less. I think in India automobile has done quite a lot of work. Some have come to 20 days, some have come to 21 days, but everybody's trying their hard to cut down, to improve the inventory turnover so that my inventory level is less without disturbing my production. Now, economic order quantity, all of you must have studied in your college time also. Those who have done MBAs, they know very well. There's an ordering cost, there's a holding cost. When you're storing something for a longer period, and my quantity is going up and up, in GIT, I'm keeping very small pieces around. But then when I, my batch size becomes bigger, my holding cost becomes higher. While in the case of, of ordering cost, when I order more quantity, my ordering cost is going in a parabolic way lower side. If you add the two components together, then become the total cost. So the total cost becomes this point at all where you can say is EOQ. Now coming back to the next ones, inventory cycles. Now when we talk of inventory cycles, so obviously you are not going to reach the zero level of inventory and then place an order. So you will keep a reorder level, keeping in mind the lead time. If you look at the x-axis, you receive the orders, you consume it. But when you come to the reorder point, so the quantity in hand is Q. Now the Q is being used on a daily basis. The moment it comes to the reorder points, you place an order. And the reorder point is such a way that the stock which is left over is sufficient enough to cover my lead time. So if my lead time is seven days, this stock should be sufficient enough to cover my production of seven days. Sometime the lead time we have planned very mechanically, but things could change last minute. So some people keep further buffer on it around. So you may have extra buffer as well as well. The reorder point is when the quantity on the hand drops to this amount, the item is reordered. The word is reorder. Safety stock, as I didn't show in that slide around, stock that is held in excess of that. As per the lead time, I'm okay, but the lead time may not happen. So seven days become nine days because of strike. You want to keep the safety stock. Then service level, sometimes you want to take care of the service level around also. You have a client. Client say, I want the goods within 10 days. 10 days mean 10 days, not 11, even not 10. So 10 days mean that service level you want, 100% service level. Accordingly, you want to keep some buffer extra. Of that. Order quantity strategies, lot for lot. Sometimes we say, guys, okay, whatever is over, I place an order. Fix order quantity round. If I go with the EOQ for each one, I have decided EOQ, I place it. Min and max systems around, okay, guys, I got two bins. This is the minimum. This is the maximum. Once it goes to this level, place an order. And then I would say, guys, okay, I'm going to place only end time in a year. So different strategies around to take care of this. Now, the next thing come is the classification. Now, the inventory classification basically starts from Pareto analysis. And the Pareto analysis, when he did his Italian guy, he what he did was how many people are rich and how much money they keep for the countries around. And he found 80-20 formulas around. 
So the 80% of the money was in the man hand of 20 wealthy people. Same concept was later on improved upon for inventory as well. They say, guys, we have A items, B category item, C category item. So A category items, typically 20% of the item, accounting to 80% of the item. Then we have got 30% of the item. So we have last one is 50% of the item. So if I draw this one in a chart, so you can see around A item is the one. So it is again major ones, 80, then left up is 20, and the 20 has been split into B and C. So B could be 15 and the C is 5. Although they are 5, but they cover a big chunk of varieties around. So this covers a much bigger variety, it's close to 55% under the C items. Nuts, bolts, oil, this small things around. Low value item, but they take same time, same efforts, maybe more space to store it. So this is the methodology we use where to do it. And same ABC concept, we use it when we think of counting around. Obviously inventory is big. You think of in India also on average, I've seen many companies around. If you look at the balance sheet, I visited one company. Their balance sheet, when I saw around, the inventory was coming around 45 days. Some companies I've seen even two months. So if you think that half of them are obsolete, the day you create them as obsolete, your profit goes out. You become a loss-making company. So inventory is could become the suicidal thing around. Cycle counting, now question come, when I want to check my inventories, when should I do it? Should I do on a daily basis? Should I do in a monthly basis? Should I do in a quarterly basis? Should I do in a six month basis or annual basis? One thing is very simple, like at home, any item which is costly, A items, the number is very small. So that needs a regular check. C items, covering 55% of my whole inventories in terms of varieties, but the value wise is 5%. I can afford to have pilferage losses, whatever maybe but its impact is very small. So I will not do regular audit part for it because the cost is very high. And this is where the technology has come up in a big way. I think it was some time back, there was a nice article, case study by someone. The company used to take one month to audit their whole store. I'm talking about a big store around. Now to do the audit and by the time you do the audit and counting, the number used to change. Obviously, the consumption is going on. New additions are coming. They say, guys, then the accuracy is very poor. They happen to have, first thing they implemented RFID. Each and every item has an RFID. They hired the drones. Now the drones will move from one end to another end and check, give you the record of everything around within 24 hours. So something which was taking one month and with all inaccuracies around can be done with 24 hours. Now, the, this gives you again the same thing which I was trying to explain around. You've got 5,000 items, A items are so many, B items are so many, C items are so many. Then how many days are required when you're trying to plan the audit part? Okay, guys, A items, I will do it after so many days. So A item every month, 20 working days, B items every quarter, C item every six months. So that's where we are trying to work it out. So when you're trying to audit something, you can work it out how many days this will take. Lastly, but not the least, is the technology part. Actually, in whole subject of supply chain, procurement, logistics, this one is encroaching everywhere. I mean, without technology, you can't think of any subjects. Think of logistics. Now, people have started having some technology in the warehouse management system. Transport management systems, since it's very unorganized, not many. Then comes the inventory part. So if some people have done, I've seen many big companies in each one separate system, but they don't speak to each other. You can integrate. I mean, technically everything is feasible, but you won't get a real time data. So there's a big need to connect all the system as well. 
So as I was saying, and many companies today run several different systems between transportation, warehousing, and back office firms. Now, data can be imported and exported. I fully agree. Any IT will say, guys, we can do it. But this does not give you very well connected systems around. The one way it is happening around is to connect them with clouds. So with cloud, the advantage is that you are using your system, you're connected through the cloud. Your supplier is using another system. You might be having 20 suppliers, all used through the clouds. So information can be received on a real time basis. So the technology and tools which are becoming very, very popular nowadays, transportation management system, TMS, RFID, warehouse management system. This I think many people, particularly with the retail business, e-commerce company, they have already done many of them. Mobile devices, IoT, not very popular, but it's picking up, I would say. In some of the smart city, this was there also visible. So this is where I feel the technology is taking over many other things around. I have not talked about AI in this one. Specifically, we have to strengthen this before we think of AI or other things, or data analytics around. The Myers, if I talk about inventories, Myers, obviously the inventory level has to be seen as a low or high. The way I look around the benchmarks, if I had to compare internationally, let's say auto industries, if two weeks, three weeks, I can live with it. But if it is more than that, I mean, you're above the benchmark. Customer service levels, you tell somebody the goods will be delivered on this date and reaches two days back, two days late, three days late. That means your service level is poor. Inventory turnovers, and lastly, the order size and decisions are based. So based on these, we try to make this. Well, friend, with this, I want to thank you all for your patient hearing.